Oh, that's right. That's right. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll call it a order the uh, work session of April 20th, 2015. Um, make a quick report out from our closed session. Council discussed uh, city attorney billing um, and made a decision to surplus a piece of city property. Um, and that was the uh, that was the extent of our closed session discussions. Um, the next item on our agenda is the Malone annexation. Mr. Jakubiak, you want to come forward? Um, Mr. Holland, Mr. Parker, anybody else that's here for that? You all want to come forward? Pull up another chair. Yeah. I don't think Mr. Miller's here for that. Yeah. <laughs> Good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are you? Uh, I'll go ahead and start this. Okay. Recently, uh, I received an annexation petition from Dana and Patrick Malone. Um, this is, uh, um, I, don't, I also received the required annexation fees. Uh, this is approximately a 2.7 acre site located on the northwest quadrant of Snow Hill Road and East College Avenue and also where Lincoln Avenue comes uh, into play there. Uh, the annexation plan includes uh, approximately 4,700 uh, square foot uh, fast food uh, establishment and approximately 9,100 9, square foot commercial retail structure. I uh, provided uh, uh, the council with the White Compton County zoning map, city, city of Salisbury zoning map, um, the aerial map location, and uh, if you have any questions, uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Parker's here along with uh, Chris. If you have any questions. And when Tom turned this over to me, I think it was probably last summer, this annexation, so I did, I put it together an annexation team with includes a uh, representative for Public Works, uh, Salisbury Police Department, Fire Department, uh, someone for Planning and Zoning. We met um, probably a month and a half or so ago and got some of their inputs and recommendations also. Okay. Okay. Where's this again? Or Where's this again? Was it near? County Corner Royal Farms at Snow Hill Road and Oh, okay. I got you. I know where it's sitting. a big chimney. A chimney yeah. sitting out there. Right. Yeah. That's a way to put it. Thank you. Yeah. A chimney. It's a big brick chimney. It's brick work in there. Yeah. On that lot. Um, how does uh, select commercial county zone? How does that? What would the comparative zoning classification be in the city? Comparative would be general commercial. Okay, city. it's just two city based. And the uh, okay. comprehensive plan for the city calls for commercial as the recommended land use. Okay. So, right. Clear continuity among the zoning categories and the recommended use. Okay. Um, the interesting thing about this annexation is that it takes a notch away from the big donut hole that is out there from mm -hmm. Park yes. to Beagland mm -hmm. and East College, big wedge. And, um, we always thought that these annexations were good and, without considering their merits, but on the, in the sense that they help close in or take yeah. away these donut holes. Mm -hmm and make the city's boundaries more coherent. Mm -hmm. So that's how we get there, one property at a time, right? <laughs> <Perhaps>. <laughs> one step at a time. Mm -hmm. one bite at a time. <laughs> but some are bigger than others, and eventually they, they, they make their way into the city. So, um, Mr. Parker, just out of curiosity, do we know um, who the intended occupant or tenant is? Or? At, at this time, no. The, the Malones are two brothers who have recently inherited the property from their recently deceased mother. Oh my gosh. They, That's they right. Have, she was my Sunday school. Yes. Yeah, as was a lot. What was her son's name? Uh, Dana and Patrick. And they, uh, they've inherited the property. They've, they've, they are going to sell it, but they've elected through the advice of their realtor to get it annexed and get it, at least get some of the, the ambushes out of the way so mm -hmm. that anybody that comes in could develop it. Mm -hmm. So they've asked us to plan it out. What you're looking at is will roughly resemble at the end of the product, you know, probably two pad sites or one large pad site, but something that's in conformance with the commercial district. Okay. And the entrance and exits will be on Lincoln and College, further up College, not right at that intersection. Yes, ma'am. We've chosen to align it with the entrance across the street to that strip center. Yeah. Taylor's Barbecue. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> now you know where we're at, don't yeah. you? <laughs> Taylor's Barbecue. Taylor's Barbecue. Taylor's barbecue. <laughs> This is a, a very draft conceptual plan. This is not your 
your typical concept plan discussion, and we haven't had a chance to really work through with the applicant um, any particular uh, issues that we might have. Although staff has looked at it 30,000 foot level and said it's, you know, it's okay from staff's standpoint to go forward. But um, you, you might think about this as a major intersection, high visibility location, mm -hmm. and uh, worthy of some important landscaping treatment and other treatment to uh, response to its its site and its context. So maybe the stormwater management facility up at, at that location is not the best or, or proposed site plan. So uh, maybe we get away from some of the details on this plan, allow the planning staff to get to a better plan in the future. And, uh, those things that are really important to the city will try to get incorporated. So does that mean, are you saying don't, we shouldn't concern ourselves with these details right now because this is conceptual or you're saying we should, we should approve with, are you suggesting that we approve <coughs> with certain recommendations? Uh, well, t today's work session is not meant to approve it. Right, right. Yeah, I we're, mean, we're, I We're just understand. very early stages and uh, um, uh, with, um, the big, in the big picture, when we do these concept plans, um, we like to get the basic concepts worked out, but we don't want to place you in the position of approving uh, details on the plan that may make things more complicated for the planning commission when they, or the staff when they do the site plan review. Um, whether this plan is rises to any concern, you know, whether it suggests any details that might not be in the best interest of the city, we, I don't know about that just yet. But, um, but if you uh, give us the, the go ahead and move forward in discussing this in a critical way and developing an annexation agreement, we'll really evaluate this concept plan. And uh, typically, if some minor tweaks are made in the weeks or months leading up to your next meeting. Understood. Yeah, that's all. Yeah, I just wanted to share my concern about when it, the first thing when I read it was that intersection, fast food. Especially that one, there's that little pork chop island at the edge. So when you're trying to turn there and, and the traffic's coming up, big one to turn it, they're going forward on college, it can be a little tricky there. And then if you're at an entrance or an exit, that was my only, right. would be my only concern. Mm -hmm. Sorry, moving forward with any of this. Is the, uh, other than that, I'm mm -hmm. perfectly okay. Yeah. I just did have some concern about that. And I was thinking about the same thing. Um, that Laura was mentioning with the, the intersection. It looks like the curb is being pulled back um, on Route 12, is that right, uh, on Snow Hill Road for the turn, the right-hand turn on yeah, to? The, the current proposal is to leave Route 12 the way it is, um, but along College, as we get to our entrance, we have an XLD selling. Now, the Route 12 frontage will be subject to SHA. So, you know, again, as Chris mentioned, we haven't started to embark on all of those fact-finding missions until we can get a general blessing from this body. But as we move through the process, yeah, SHA is going to have their comments, and, and we'll have to comply with whatever they want us to do. Okay. All right. Um, I mean, given how early it is in the process, and, and I would be inclined to encourage this annexation to move forward. Uh, are there other questions or concerns from council? No, 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 no. Okay. It's been years since I started wondering why this place wasn't developed again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was looking at it the other day. It's like, yeah. Yeah. logical piece of property to it's, develop. Yeah, Good stuff. Saying earlier, it's not often you get one where it's, what else are we going to put there? Right. You know, <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> All right, excellent. Um, well, so there's council consensus to allow this to continue to move forward? Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you. Great. Thank you all for having us. Thanks, Brock. Thank Thanks for waiting. All right. Next item on our agenda is uh, election 2015 redistricting update. Mr. Tillman, how are we doing? Well, I spoke to uh, the attorney for the ACLU the other day, and she told me that it was pretty clear that the NAACP was going to be substituted as their new um, client. She sent back, um, this time, a second version of the motion that, that we would file jointly. And I've got, I take issue with a couple things in there, but not, not a lot. Uh, it's basically just sort of glorifies the ACLU's role in the redistricting. But uh, I, I, don't, I don't think that's really necessary. Okay. 
Okay. But, uh, you know, and I don't think that's something that they're going to demand putting in. But, uh, you know, I think we've got the agreement worked out. They apparently have a client. And she advised me that there was no way anybody could challenge the city's current district. That was okay. her opinion. That was, those are her words. Those are her words. <laughs> All right. Let's hope flips, that's true. On the flip side of that, the language that you take some issue with, is it worth spending the time and money to worry about taking it out? I, or can we just send it? I think it would not be in the city's best interest to say some of the things that they've stuck in there okay. that they didn't <laughs> demand earlier. But... Uh, What were they? Hmm? What were the? What were the um, things? Let me see. I've got it right here. The uh, the city and the ACL. You believe the five district plan offers all Salisbury voters a fair opportunity to elect their representatives of choice. And given the demographics of today, better conforms to the goals of the Voting Rights Act than did the two district system. Um, I think we all are uh, in agreement uh, that uh, it gives everyone a fair choice, but I don't think the city wants to make any admission whatsoever that the prior system was illegal. Okay. Uh, I mean, that first of all, that was a system that was initially agreed to right. by all parties then. Including so I don't think we should admit that. that that's the primary thing. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense to me. And that, that, was something, yeah, let's not say that was something new that they just stuck in the latest version, but I don't think they're going to demand that. Okay. Okay. Sounds good. All right. So what's the timeline now at this point for getting it to um, she wouldn't commit to me. I tried to get her to give me a date, um, but, and I, I told her, she said, I'm still toying with it, and I said, well, send me what you have, and that's what she did last week. Um, I think, I don't remember what day I got it. Friday, she sent it to me. But uh, I'm going to push her to get it done. I mean, I see no reason. If the, if the NAACP is on board, there's no reason why this can't be done very quickly. Okay. okay. You push her to get it done. I thought we had to file it. We you know, I mean, it's a joint motion, so okay. she has to sign it for it to okay. be a joint motion. Um, so, but, you know, I, I've, she's been telling me all along that there's not a problem, and now she's told me that the NAACP is going to step forward, so. Well, let's keep pushing her on it. Okay. All right. We'll continue to discuss until we get that thing resolved. All right. Next item on our agenda is, or I'm sorry, are there any other questions from council? Okay. Next item on our agenda is changes to the noise ordinance. Um, and Mr. Holland, is he in the hallway? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Is Miss Phillips here too? Mm -hmm. Yes. Can she join us for that conversation? Susan, can you join us for this conversation? Can you both? This is noise ordinance. Oh, noise ordinance. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it's, it's, it's you. But I have a question for mm. oh, yeah. At least it was coming this way. Okay. Okay. All right. The floor is yours. Okay. Recently, or in the past several months, the city's been receiving complaints uh, regarding construction activities. Uh, of, uh, residential uh, projects uh, currently under construction and uh, I believe it was our March 2nd meeting uh, we first came to the council uh, regarding making some changes uh, to the noise ordinance and um, when we left uh, we pretty much had our you know directives of how you wanted this uh, revised and what it's done it's uh, given pretty much from Monday through Friday, left the hours between uh, 7 in the morning to 6 p.m. in the evening. Saturdays, it does allow people to, it's not just work, but uh, to work noisily, I guess, between the hours of uh, uh, 9 and 6, and it also allows people to uh, you know, do uh, the construction work between 12 and 6 p.m. on Sunday. 
and if there's a uh, to determine that uh, you know, public health and safety will not be impaired during construction activities, uh, that they could receive a permit to work in hours um, that aren't established in this ordinance. So are there, is there currently an, an ability for you to issue a building permit that allows individuals to do work that is beyond those hours so long as they don't violate the noise ordinance? Yes. Okay. I assumed that. I assumed that, yeah. But it's not I, I, I would explicit. Issue uh, to build a deck on the back of your house. Uh, right. I mean, naturally, it's probably most of it's going to be done during the weekend when, when you have free time. What about, yeah, and even painting that deck. Painting, I mean, yeah, that, yeah, that, that would not be a noisy activity. Paint noisily. Uh, but the way I, <laughs> I guess the way I read it now is party. that that would be mm -hmm. prohibited. <laughs> no, it, actually, th this ordinance doesn't prohibit it. What it says right. is that construction activity during these hours is presumed to violate the noise ordinance. So if somebody was a lone painting contractor painting the side of a building with a can of paint right. and someone complained that he was violating the noise ordinance, I think he would have the opportunity to come to court and say, I wasn't, I was making less noise than one of the homeowners cutting the grass. So, and, so, and I don't think a judge would find him in violation. Right. So this is why I think that it's important to add, you know, We've got the section on chapter 8.20.020, prohibited noises enumerated, where it lists all the different you know, types in section I or paragraph I is construction or repairing of buildings. And you know, so that we're articulating what the different types of noise are. Uh, but, but in uh, section 8.20.010, unreasonably loud noises prohibited, A, where it says it shall be unlawful for any person to make blah, 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 blah within the corporate limits of the city of Salisbury. I mean, I, I feel like this is where it's important for us to say at the end, what I've seen in numerous noise ordinances elsewhere in such a manner as to be plainly audible at a distance of 50 feet or more from the building or structure in which it is located. And that that shall be a presumed violation of this section. To, to give some way to measure it, rather that's, than that's just to... What I was going to, that was my next comment. Okay, now, I'm sorry. How, no, I, it means to do it. Uh, no, how, you know, what, how do you measure it? What is, what is too much noise and uh, what's an acceptable noise level? I, right. And nothing in our code currently says how you measure that. However, Chief Duncan, I'm not sure if you can speak to this, but I think the standard practice is that 50 feet, or, you know, or some measurement is, is given and from a distance of 50 feet from the property line, if the noise is audible, then it's considered a violation of the noise ordinance. For example, uh, there are instances where ordinances do not call for a, sorry? Uh, Could you come yeah, up? Yeah, do you mind coming to the microphone? Okay. Um, there are instances where ordinances do not call for a noise ordinance, but there are instances where ordinances do call for a noise ordinance. Afternoon. Thank, Thank you. you. So there are instances where um, ordinances do call for some type of noise meter type of um, device right. to measure the decibel levels from a particular uh, distance from the property line as well. I, I read that as well in several, you know, I looked at a bunch and in quite a few cases they, I mean, it says this is the acceptable um, decibel level in uh, residential zone, you know, R8, and this is the acceptable noise level in general commercial, and this is, Correct. and you know, which is fine, but that requires the acquisition of equipment. Mm -hmm. um, it does. That, that it does. becomes slightly more complicated. And I think, you know, given that the current practice, as I understand it, is the 50 feet, putting that in law actually, you know, is something I found in various cases in other communities. So that makes sense to me. I mean, it's still a little bit subjective, you know. It, I, I it can is. hear it from 50 feet away. Correct. But. Correct. So it's something rather than just saying, you know, can't make any, noise. any noise which <laughs> annoys. Oops, Would you want to say disturbing and audible? Well, I mean, because yeah. you, what, yeah. what are you going to do when your neighbor cuts his grass? Sure, it says in such a manner as to be. Mm, yeah. Well, this just says well, right, right. It's section including excavation, demolition, alteration, or repair of any building. No, no, no. This would be uh, he was talking about not in, not in. Section eight two zero zero two zero, but oh, zero one zero. 
so so that it would be both. Yeah. If if what I read, which you know was language that I took from other places, I think it was a mishmash. But um, it says you know it's the language as written, and instead of the sentence ending with of the city of Salisbury. So it says, it shall be unlawful for any person to make, continue, or cause to be made, or continued. Any unreasonably loud, I didn't write that. Any unreasonably loud noise, or any noise which either annoys, disturbs, injures, or endangers the comfort, repose, health, peace, or safety of others within the corporate limits of the city of Salisbury, in such a manner as to be plainly audible at a distance of 50 feet or more from the building or structure in which, the, in which it is located shall be a prima facie violation of this section. I don't even know if that's necessary. Seems to be that's, subjective. I think that last piece we've done. <laughs> yes, very much so. Yeah. Yeah. But, it's, it's but difficult. today it's just noise. This says from 50 feet. Yeah. If, it's, if it's doing any of those things from 50 feet. And again, that's what's in. I would make sure there was any of, not all of, that it's clear that it's not, you don't have to be annoying and disturbing and can somebody else say, well, it's not bothering well, it's a, it already, Yeah, it already says that, either. I don't have it in front of me, so. It's not yeah. far. How far is 50 feet? Very short. Mm -hmm. So if someone's putting up a fence, or building a doghouse. Correct. Do and then the neighbor wants to be nasty and say he's disturbing the pieces. Well, they have the hours to do it within. So they can't get out there at 5 o'clock in the morning and build a doghouse. Okay. Yeah, that's essentially. Lots of the protection. What, what the section that's yeah, been amended mm -hmm. now, or the section that we have before us that's okay. been amended, it now gives explicit hours, 9 a.m. to okay. 6 p.m. Right, right now. 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. Okay. to 6 p.m. Saturday, and 12 p.m. to 6 p.m. on Sunday. I didn't recall having Sunday in there. Um, talking about individuals maintaining their own property, Sunday makes sense. Um, but when you're talking about commercial activity, which is considerably louder. You've got 20, 30 people on the site hammering, banging, moving equipment, moving, not just somebody building a doghouse. Um, well, if I may, I, I think there's a difference because there's a lot of construction that goes on doesn't make any noise. Painting, all those kinds of things don't make any noise. And, and again, from a business point of view and looking at the generation of new business and economic growth, the more jobs they can complete, then the more money comes into the city and the jobs get finished quicker. So I think there's a balance, yes, there, there's definitely a balance that has to be maintained. Um, but I think that there's room for those areas. If you're going to finish up a job, and again, from a practical point of view, if you're finishing up a job and you've just, all you have to do is paint trim, and it's, you got a half a day on Sunday to, to finish it up rather than bring your whole crew in on Monday where you can start a new job, that makes a huge difference in terms of the efficiency and the profit of the, of the company. I agree, but then we're, talking, we're not talking about the kinds of things that we're addressing here that are noisy. It's the noise issue when they're just starting the construction when the concrete mixer is out there, when they're laying the... Uh, putting up the walls and doing the ha hammering on the roof. I'd like one day of rest, personally, where I don't have to hear somebody hammering. If I want to sleep till 3 o'clock in the afternoon, I don't have to hear for 20 hours, for 6 hours, or what is it? Yeah, 12 to 12 o'clock till 6. 12 to 6 on Sunday. If, if I may, the Chief and I had an opportunity to talk about this, and really the best way to go here, and I not necessarily suggesting we overcomplicate this, but is with a noise meter and a prescribed decibel level because otherwise it's just too subjective because officer arrives on the scene and he may not necessarily believe that the sound is uh, disturbing or injurious, but the person calling the complaint may say that it is. So then when we get into court, where are we? And Chief, we talked about this. The equipment, the yes. equipment is not that expensive. Oh, Dominic, it's not expensive. No, yeah. it's not. not that expensive, and yeah. it puts you on a very solid foundation Correct. when you attempt to prosecute a citation yes. um, because you've measured the distance, you've exceeded the, the decibel level, you have a pretty cut and dry mm -hmm. case. Yeah. And, and then to go back to the complaint and say, mm -hmm. we, we've checked, I'm sorry, it may be 
uh, offensive to you, but they're not in violation. So. So let me let me make sure. Okay. So so that that's would. Not, that's not how it's written now. I realize that. But. Um, so essentially, we would leave the 8.20.010 as it stands, and then follow that with something like um, the following limits on uh, the following limits on um, decibels, decibels will be applied by zoning broad zoning classifications of like industrial commercial correct residential correct okay and, and then, then link to particular days of the week right and, right. and then link that to particular correct. hours of the day then yep. you got a chart and it's clear and exactly. either it's there or it's not there that's right and there's no judgment yeah. so so the period of time however where there's really no cap on on noise is still in question in my mind um based on what laura said um, 7 a.m. to 6 p.m. Monday through Friday. There's there's really no limit. Well, but we discussed that it there still would be subject to. It, this, you have to understand this paragraph is a presumption. So when you go to court on a you know in this case it would be a misdemeanor and you go before the judge, if you're doing or construction during the hours when you're not supposed to, the court is to presume that you are being overly noisy. But if the person were to show that they were just painting the trim on a house and there was no real noise and it was just irritating the neighbor because he was there, not because he was making noise, um, he would be found not guilty. This is just a presumption so that the landowner isn't forced to say, you know, how noisy is construction. So, and it really leaves it up to the discretion of the judge to decide whether the person is acting reasonably or not. I think most judges would allow someone to build a doghouse you know, between, you know, 9 and 10 a.m. on Sunday morning uh, if they were doing it themselves versus bringing in backhoes and, you know, digging a pool. Uh, at that point, I think this presumption would apply and the, and the contractor would be found to have violated the noise ordinance. But that, that's really what the current code does. It really leaves it to the discretion of the judge who's hearing the case as to whether or not the person was being unreasonably loud. But can't we make it more clear in here so we're not spending money in court defending these? Right. Yeah, the, the whole purpose of this ordinance was not to rewrite the whole noise ordinance. It was just to solve the issue of the weekday, the weekday weekend. Right. That's all this attempted to do. Right. Um, certainly, we can rewrite the noise ordinance to achieve any goal that you want to achieve, but that wasn't the purpose of this particular right. ordinance. It was. I, I had a much more limited directive, I thought, when you I was did. asked to draft it. You did, and we, we, we were going to just fix the weekday issue and then address the noise uh, ordinance separately because it could get so complicated. Right, but we're um, going to do it all in one shot. Okay. We're not going to hear this 22 times over the next few years like we've done with <coughs> other things. Yeah. Yeah. But, so, you know, protect the people from unreasonable noise, yeah. keep people out of court, keep ourselves out of court, mm -hmm. and just have an objective determination when it's necessary. Right. End of story. Yeah. Yep. It won't be difficult to find a decibel no. noise ordinance to use it as so, a... Uh, so what I want to do in the meantime, though, is I want us to have consensus around the rest of the changes so that we're just plugging in a little chart. Right. That's, I mean, that's where we need to get. You know, this needs to not be one of those things that gets dragged out yes. forever, like, you know, towing or uh, false. <laughs> false alarms. Um, okay. So, uh, all right. In in the section I on or paragraph I on construction and repairing of buildings, um, there is the outstanding question of Sunday. Um, and ensuring that a building permit, as you suggested, Bill, a building permit can allow work to happen so long as it doesn't violate the noise ordinance. Okay, all right, well that, that helps quite a bit. Um, the other question that I had is um, for Susan, just regarding, um, you know, I think at one point, pieces of this code referenced the housing official. Just wanna make sure that we're not creating work for three departments or a role for three departments. I want to make this as simple as possible. You know, um, do you see a role for the housing official in making a determination of when, whether or not there's a violation? I you should just slide your chair away from the table. <laughs> and you, and, and you absolutely can. Yeah. 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 And you absolutely can. Yeah, where it is, uh, right here. And I don't, and I have actually have not read the ordinance because it was 
Right. I didn't have anything to do with it, so um, I, I don't because this pertains to the building. So I don't know if it was a draft version or what, but I've, I've got okay. a couple of sure. different copies of drafts and one of them references the house. Okay. If you want to change it, your building official is. Does it currently say housing? Yeah. yeah. Ah, that's what it says. Yeah, the current says code yeah. calls it, for that. Yeah, it it 32, not. 35. It does. Mm -hmm. It says neighborhood services code compliance. All right. We need to change that yeah. to building. Yeah, I see it. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Just with regard to construction and repair, that one subsection, because the general yes. code is enforced by neighborhood services. Police department. Or, yeah. Yeah, the other one. In reference to Chapter 8, yeah, 8. So the building official will just be responsible for issuing right. uh, mm -hmm. the, the exceptions, basically. Okay. So 135. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And then the... And 32. And again, there's still this, the outstanding question of Sunday. But the, the, the other piece of this, 8.20.130 violation, any violation of this chapter shall be punishable as a misdemeanor. Um, and this is where our conversation last time went about uh, stating that upon a second violation, well, uh, so there are a couple different ways this could be written, but any violation of this chapter may also be punishable as a municipal infraction and saying upon a second violation of uh, section 8.20.020I, construction or repairing of buildings, the building official in consultation, the building official may suspend or revoke an active building permit. Now, is that something that needs to be written into this, or can you do that anyway? I can, I can issue stop work in yeah. accordance with... Uh, can, can a misdemeanor trigger you to issue stop work if, you know... Yeah, if, if we make the building permit dependent upon their compliance with the law, if they fail to comply with the law, he can issue a stop work. Okay, so we don't need to add that. Well, maybe in the bill, in the if we don't have the requirement that they is, is it in there already as far as the um, building permit that no. they have to come. No, we would need to add that to the uh, it doesn't building say permit. That they have to follow applicable applicable laws. Everybody to get a building has permit. To right. Yeah. Does it need to be stated? So, so you would have no mechanism to to say. I mean, if somebody was just saying, yeah, I can uh, forget work. forget you. Handy. <laughs> I mean, you have uh, stop work notice for zoning ordinance, stop work notice for uh, building code uh, violation, then you have a stop work notice for chapter section of the city code. Okay. Okay. Good. All right. So you do have. Okay. Okay. All right. Good. Good. Any chapter, okay. any section that's applicable. So that's you just write in what it is. All right. Thank you. And this would be an applicable section. Okay. All right. Um, so then the only outstanding additions or changes need to be the, the addition of the um, decibel definitions, some breakdown there. Mm -hmm. And then the second piece is the question of Sunday. And I'd be fine removing Sunday now that I understand that work could happen so long as it doesn't violate noise. Um, and we do have... Uh, construction expert in the room. Mr. Miller, would you, sure. do you have any comment? Well, yeah, respectfully, Laura, you're, you're right. Everybody wants to have quiet enjoyment of your yeah. land. Would you say it from the... Yeah. Dwight Miller with Gillis Gilkerson. Uh, everybody deserves to have quiet enjoyment of their land, but keep in mind, for instance, this winter, lots of days, the construction industry wasn't able to work at all, whereas other people that had inside jobs were able to work. That Saturday and Sunday may be the only time those people get a chance to work to support their families and get their 40 hours of work in. So please be careful on condensing the hours that a construction industry employee can work because they won't be able to support their families, which means we won't have quality work, which means the city of Salisbury and Wacombe County will not be looked upon as a builder-friendly area and nobody's going to want to build here because it would be too restrictive. A noise ordinance is, is perfect. We work around noise ordinances in lots of different municipalities. I have no problems with that. But, you know, there's today or this morning, a lot of crews didn't show up for work. And a lot of them started up around 10 o'clock. But you know, they, they, they need their right to try to get their hours in. You don't want them working too many off hours where building and housing and uh, zoning can't come and inspect it to make sure it's being done correctly. 
but you still want them to get that project built because I think Jack said earlier, the sooner that project is completed, sooner revenue starts coming back into the city. You know, the construction activity itself is a very temporary discomfort, if you will. Sure. Uh, and it's, it's, you know, the, the framing is a small portion of it. But you're, you're right, the, the framing can be obtrusive. But if, if by, you know, 7 o'clock in the morning on Saturday, or 9 o'clock as you've got it written now, and even at 12 o'clock on Sunday, people are home from church, if people want to work, they can work. Mm -hmm. uh, also, we want to limit the calls that everyone here would be getting. Well, they're working. Well, they're laying carpet, they're painting, they're installing you know, cabinets, oh, yeah. th things that are quiet, but you don't want to give someone the opportunity to become burdensome in calling people on things that really doesn't, doesn't need to be addressed. Right, and we talked about that the yeah. last time, I'm sorry. Right. We talked about that last time, the difference between inside work and the outside mm -hmm. work from the excavating right. the land to, right. to the building itself um, can, can be pretty noisy. Once mm -hmm. they're inside, then that that's different, but we didn't we didn't put any differentiation in here for that, um, other than by the noise, noise. Um, because. And there's going to be some things that could be above and beyond any contractor's uh, control, if you will, like a dumpster comes in, picks them up, and they back up. And the other morning, we got a call where a rental company was picking up one of the subcontractors' machines at five o'clock in the morning. Fired the machine up, all the backup beepers went off like they're supposed to, and you know, was disturbing at five o'clock in the morning. I get that. But there's some things you just don't have any control over. Well, it's it's interesting looking at the noise ordinance, looking at the noise section of our code. I mean, the, those noises, you know, like the delivery of boxes mm -hmm. and the picking up of dumpsters, those are addressed in other mm -hmm. you know, sections right. of this code. Right. So I mean, you know, that that wouldn't I mean, that doesn't fall, in my opinion, under the the holder of a building permit. Mm -hmm. That that falls under you know, that what? contractor who is there to pick up a, a roll off or something. Just we wouldn't want to create, you know, you're saying after the second violation, it's X, X happens. Well, if one of those violations were, we didn't even know they were coming. Right. You know, you call for pickup and they just happen to be the area. They, you know, so, but, you know, we, you know, inherently when we have heavy equipment because of OSHA and MOSHA, they all make lots of noise over and above just the noise of the engines. And they're, they're supposed to. So, I mean, you know, just looking back on this conversation about Sunday for a minute, um, you know, currently the code uh, says weekdays. Uh, this, this applies weekdays. We're now defining Monday through Friday and Saturday since they were surprised, shockingly to all of us, a weekday can be defined to include Saturday. Um, but, uh, but the Sunday piece, I just want to make sure that, you know, uh, that I'm understanding here that a, a building permit can allow or does allow for work any day of the week. Um, but the noise ordinance would restrict when certain noisy or, you know, uh, what we hope is soon to be objectively noisy. High reading. <laughs> right. Um, work would be prohibited during those hours um, or, or outside of those hours. So on that basis, you know, I want to try to understand to what extent um, it would be injurious to you or to other builders to not be able to make that noise on you know Sunday morning and Sunday evening because that's really what we're all we're talking about. Right. You know, if, you're, if doing Sundays, I mean, you know, from 12 to 6, that gives them six hours. Um, you know, I look at roofers and other company. You know, a lot of them not, they they work out of their pickup trucks and they'll start at six o'clock in the morning. Uh, granted, a lot of the projects that we primarily get involved in, we're not as we are in this project, right in a bunch of neighborhoods' backyards. So, I mean, it's. I mean, so maybe what we can do is when we um, when we have our little chart, right, with days of the week, maybe they're in residential zones. Mm -hmm. uh, it's more restricted. More restricted than other areas, right? But I still think that that a Sunday. A group of Sunday hours would be important because you get three or four days of rain during a week and nobody can work outside. You know, we want to make sure that everyone has the opportunity to, to earn a living. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, well, I'm convinced to leave the Sunday hours in um, and to restrict it by zoning group, and we've got to be as general as possible, I would think, and try to, you know, classify 
categories of that. Yeah, residential, commercial, and industrial as, as best as possible mm -hmm. rather than, you know, river, riverfront redevelopment yeah. district and, you know, and so as best as possible if we can categorize those into three or four subcategories, that'd be, that'd be great. Um, and then do we need to add that to the budget? Does council need to add that at the noise yes, meter to the budget or is it? I, I can, um, let, let me get some quotes okay. on that because there's a specified type of meter that you okay. need that has to be ANSI approved, ANSI approved. Understood. So let me get a quote on that. Okay. Chief, Possibly. if I could to get a quote for the one that gives you the printout. That and a, uh, the, the distance reader. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. All right. Is there a council consensus to move this forward? Yes. Yes. Please. Okay. All right. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Chief. Yes, and thank you, Bill. Chief, will that have other applications as well? You're going oh, to use this oh yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Parties and parties. You bet. Any any noise that's now subjectively <laughs> determined, we'll yeah. be able to Great. use that. Um, but would we need more than one? That's yes. another thing to consider because. Yeah, sure. <laughs> yeah. So whatever recommended number right. yeah. is the number we should get. Well, thank you for something we've talked too. about. Too. That was you all for budgetary you. heads up. Of <laughs> one's not going to cut it. You probably want a sidearm there too, don't you, Bill? Sure. <laughs> All right. Um, next item on our agenda is registration of non-conforming residential properties. Um, Ms. Phillips. Okay. Actually, Mark they present had that asked one. me to okay. go okay. over we're this gonna, one. We're going to answer questions. Okay. All right. What's been prepared thus far is an ordinance that would amend uh, the zoning code, basically, um, that would require um, multifamily dwellings in a single family uh, area to comply by registering their, uh, I guess the, uh, whatever, you know, unit that it was, they would have to be registered. And then it would also have to meet certain standards of basic safety. Um, and if they do that, then they could continue as a non-conforming use. If they failed to register, I think within one year, if my memory serves me correctly, they would lose their status as a uh, non-conforming uh, use within the district. And this would apply uh, solely to the single family uh, neighborhoods that are identified in the memo there. Um, they would, I mean, the ordinance would call, it calls for an inspection that would be done as well to make sure that they meet those standards that are in the bullets that are identified. Um, really, the, uh, the, I think the mayor's interest in this ordinance was uh, that it would give the city uh, a handle on what's out there um, and anything that didn't register would basically disappear, the right to maintain that. Do you have any specific questions? I, I, have, a, I have a question. Sure. Jack. Is there any difference between what, is, what the requirements would be for a CO versus what we're asking for here? I'm sorry, for what? A CO. Certificate is the same. Is it different than what you, a CO would require? Y yes, it is probably different. See, these properties now, um, they have to comply with the building codes uh, that are out there. But... I guess what you're, what you're doing is you're saying to this individual, you know, yes, you comply with the building codes because this place was built in 1920 or whatever, uh, which, and there were no standards, so you don't have to upgrade them. But if you're going to use it as a multifamily dwelling in a single-family neighborhood, that there are some basic, like, fire and life safety issues that have to be dealt with. The alarm, I think that... Uh, what was it, Bill, the alarms and the fire extinguishers, uh, various things that are listed in those bullet signs, there. Emergency lighting. Right. The basic. emergency lighting. And those are all things that are literally life safety issues. Um, it, this would not require them, for example, to do structural changes in the building or do anything like that to comply with the building code. But it would be different. And it's, it's re just recognizing the fact that you know, we, we do permit these multifamily uses in single-family neighborhoods to the extent that they're otherwise permitted under the code because they predate the code. Uh, but where it becomes a, a, a safety or a threat to human life, then we're going we're gonna to have certain standards. I think we should also, well, I mean, from a, from, a, from a planning standpoint, we're talking about something 
that is, uh, uh, we're talking about a, a multi-family dwelling or unit existing in a single family neighborhood as if that is inherently something that shouldn't happen. And from a planning standpoint, conventional wisdom is today that that should happen as frequently as possible. That, those, that you want a mix of those uses and you, we want to get rid of R5, R8, R, get rid of all of those classifications. You know, we are antiquated in that we still have a Euclidean zoning approach. You know, we, we are one of, we're becoming a dinosaur. Um, and, you know, we, so this, I mean, this presumes that this is a bad thing. From well, the, the there's different, a, I was going to say, yeah. there, there's a, if I remember it correctly, it's been ages since it was done, but, um, for example, if it was originally constructed as a multifamily dwelling, then that's okay. It's, it's really where properties were con were converted to multifamily use. And I think that the experience of the city is that those converted properties are the ones that are the most dangerous um, and you know have the most life safety issues uh, that need to be addressed and at least discovered. So See, this, this was, uh, this, I'm sorry. Well, Go ahead. well, this treads into a second <laughs> policy area, one that we have, um, we have decided not to support as a council in the past, which was a request from uh, the fire department to, in cases of non-conforming, legal non-conforming um, properties, to begin to uh, a categorization and a, a registry of them on that basis, so that firefighters, you know, had some sense of which properties were, you know, might be cut up, and um, you know, again, that's that's someone who registers and says this is how it is from a life safety standpoint. Um, but I mean, you know, that, that is also something that this council has rejected moving forward on because they, you know, the county has those responsibilities right now and we, you know, we're looking to kind of support that collaboration and collaborative approach to this particular activity with the county. Um, now I understand the value of it from a life safety standpoint, um, but from a, from a planning standpoint in terms of how you compose your neighborhoods, um, this is this reads very out of date yeah. and out of touch. I think the ordinance even says we acknowledge that this is not a good thing for, for our city. I don't think that we do acknowledge that. I have a number of questions related to some of the details in here, but first and foremost, my question is, we are currently involved in a lawsuit related to this issue specifically. I have concerns that we're even discussing making any further changes to this until that's settled. Um, Mr. Tillman, I guess the question is, is for you, and I'm not even sure what the question is, should we be talking about this? What's the status um, even? You know? it's, it's on appeal. We lost. Right. Appeal. I remember that. But yeah, it, it was, it was, it was appealed to the circuit court, and the circuit court um, found in favor of the homeowner. Um, found that the city was equitably stopped from enforcing the law because, as I read the decision, because we had failed to enforce the law for so many years, we couldn't now do it. Um, I think that the court was wrong in that decision, and I think an appellate court will either reverse the circuit court or it will change the law in Maryland. Uh, because that, that has never been the standard that was applied in the case of equi equitable estoppel in the past. So, I mean, I, I think we will ultimately win. Uh, one, I think one of the, this, this legislation comes out of that case to the extent that this was a property that was not, never legal in the way it was utilized as a multifamily dwelling. It, uh, based on the square footage of the house and the, and the uh, lot size and everything else, there was no way that this was ever legal under the Salisbury Code to use it as a multifamily dwelling. But um, apparently, the city turned a blind eye or didn't know. Um, the, I think the mayor's uh, decision here to start this registry was so that the city would know where these non-conforming uh, uses exist, to create a list um, that could be utilized in the future, as you indicated, for fire protection or for, for any other use or for simply enforcing the law. Well, I'd be interested to hear um, from Mr. Heath his thoughts on that, uh, the, the life safety um, perspective. But before that, I just want to say that, you know, I, I agree with Ms. Mitchell regarding the uh, <coughs> walking down this road before we've got resolution to that case. Um, and I also want to assert that I believe the 
term estoppel was made up to confuse me. Um, and and I don't know what that is. E equitable, equitable estoppel generally. That's, e that's even been, more made up. Well, yeah. it, it's basically where the city took some action to mislead right. the homeowner and or, you know, that's where it's generally applied. And zoning estoppel generally applies where someone wants to come to your town and build something that you don't want, and they they break ground on the project, and then the legislative body passes a law prohibiting it in that zone. And in those cases, the court has held that the city was stopped from preventing this construction from going forward of, of that particular use, whatever it was. Okay. There, it is, it, it's, it's been the the, the courts in Maryland have been very reluctant to apply that estoppel principle, extremely reluctant. And, um, you know, that's, I don't, I think that what the circuit court did in this particular case was extended about as far as you could go. And I, I feel pretty confident that the Court of Special Appeals, or if not the Court of Special Appeals, the Court of Appeals would reverse it. Because the Court of Special Appeals in the past has come down closer to the side of this decision by the, by the, uh, circuit court, but the Court of Appeals has consistently said no. <coughs> so, and we're at the Court of Special Appeals level right now. When will that, when will that be heard? Um, it's been heard. We're waiting, and it can take anywhere from a few months to a year to get your decision from them, and we haven't gotten one yet. When was that heard? Maybe in January, I think. It was I January 12th. Yeah, May. something like that. Jack, do you have any thoughts regarding? Just life safety and awareness of it. Yeah, this, it's a tough one. Um, and I, I, the reason it's tough is for those people who are forward and tell you what's going on, it's great. But there are a lot of people who do things and change things inside the homes on their own, and you don't find out. And there's cases where firemen have gone in to do a search on the second floor through a second floor window and ended up in a closet where they've, you know, and those aren't good things, I mean, obviously. Um, from the other aspect of it, I, I guess my question originally was, if someone's going to do a conf legitimate conforming, they, there is no CO that's issued at that time for the modifications that are made to that building? Well, well first and foremost, they have to get a zoning approval before I issue a permit. Okay. Yeah. And, and if, it, if it was by chance, uh, uh, it could be issued. If it was like a change of use or changing up the inside to, right. as a multifamily, yeah, it would be a CO. And if they're uh, so, there would there would, would be, be a change, C the, change of use. Uh, they would have to um, you know, bring it up to current standards. Right. Well, that was my question earlier, and I, I probably heard it wrong. That, that it's different. than the CO that was originally, I, I must have misunderstood. So if someone's going to change their configuration in their home for multi-use, multi, from what it currently is, there has to be a permitting process. There's a, so you know about those. Sure. The only ones you don't know about are the ones that people are doing it illegally. Exactly. So the registering, what's to, I guess if I'm going to register, you, am I making? Yeah, yeah, I'm yeah. only the legal so ones are going to register. Only the, the legal ones are going to register. Mm -hmm. The illegal ones are not going to register. It, it, so where are we? It, if I could, though, the, the administration understood the council's position when we were talking about this issue months or even a year ago. Uh, the idea of amortization was proposed and we heard the council when you said that there is a place for these uses within these neighborhoods in this day and time and Councilwoman Shields is shaking her head and I think we would all agree that there is a need. So we've taken a step back and said, we've tried to hear the council and we said, okay, we understand that. Maybe we were not very forward thinking. If these types of uses are going to exist within our neighborhoods in the city of Salisbury. We'd like to, for the sake of the occupants, the tenants, those folks that are using these places as their place of abode, I think as the code reads, 
we, we just simply want to make sure, because there was some acquiescence on the part of the city over the years, to allow these single family homes to be carved up into multifamily use with no building permit, no certificate, certificate of occupancy, no real understanding of what they look like inside, and no measures to provide any increased level of protection <coughs> for the occupants. That's really what we're trying to accomplish here. We're not trying to overregulate anybody. Mm -hmm. We're simply saying that we recognize that they're out there. We'd like to have an opportunity to make sure we know where they all are and a chance to inspect them and require that the life safety conditions be improved minimally for the protection of the occupants and the owners. Okay, and I agree with that and I understand that and I'm right on board, we're right together. But my issue is still the same issue I've, I've had. For the people who have not, who have done things and have not followed the, the process, whether it was prior to us mm -hmm. instituting it or not, mm -hmm. If I've done something illegal, I'm not going to register with you. Right. I'm sorry. So what you're going to end up doing is taking those mm -hmm. people who have followed the rules and, and applied for the permit. And I will tell you, the fire department counts a lot on making sure that those, those codes are, are met. Because then if the codes are met, we know how to attack <clears> it. <throat> it's those people where you go in through a window and you're in a closet where you go, wait a minute, there's four walls here and there's no way of getting out. That's where the issues come in. Right. But those people are not going to, in my opinion, and I might be wrong, are not going to go and voluntarily register for this. I, I would agree that with you in that there are some people that will not register. The majority of property owners that have these uses will register. It will afford us the opportunity to go through and perform the inspection make the recommendation or requirement for the minimum improvements. And if we get to 95% of them, 96% of them, we've put all of those tenants in a better situation. And then when we find that property owner that's unwilling to register and make the improvements that are required, then we deal with them accordingly. So we simply heard the council say, these uses are out there, they're gonna stay out there. We're, we're, we're trying to protect the occupants and the property owners. Not trying to make, we're not trying to overregulate the industry. <coughs> And there will be some that won't comply. I, I mean, I concede to that. It's everywhere. Everybody speeds, everybody runs red lights. But this proposal deals with the person who fails to register by basically taking away his grandfathered status. So that, I guess, in the case of 507 Poplar Hill, if, if that were an illegal residence and the person did not register, then the law, there would be no argument you could make that you were equitably stopped or anything else. The code would find because you failed to register, you failed to allow us to inspect the prop property that you no longer have that favored non-conforming use status. That's how they deal with a person who doesn't come forward. If there's a problem, if that individual is discovered, then they're deemed non you know, as Ill an illegal use. Whereas now they can argue, I am legal. You just didn't know I did this 40 years ago. That's an argument they can make. But if they, under this registration procedure, they could no longer make that argument. Um, okay. So, Laura, did you have something? Or, well, I was just shame. thinking, if they're not Somebody. grandfather, if they're illegal, they're not grandfathered. So, so what if they lose their grandfathering status? They didn't have it to begin with. I still don't see how that in... in uh, necessarily see how that entices them to come forward and register um, if when they're caught that gives a different set of as you just explained right. a different set of options for us the less options for them but um, right so why would a legal non-conforming right. fail to register they would they would definitely register right so they'd lose nothing and so we already know about this. Right. So we, know that we already know but, about this. Because they the process. But what you don't have right now is the opportunity for the person in the unit on the first floor right who has a stove fire. There's no indication for the person who's on the third floor left to know that that's occurring downstairs. Because those properties were not designed to be used that way. That's what we're trying to help. Yeah, but, okay, so, so when I look at the non-conforming use proposed safety regulations, in here. Um, all of those things sound wonderful. Emergency lighting, illuminated exit signage, fire alarm system, portable, portable fire extinguishers, carbon monoxide alarms, 
uh, windows and bedrooms in good working order, smoke alarms installed. All of that makes sense mm -hmm. to me. Um, the, the question, and, and, and Tom, you know, I didn't associate this with the point that you were making when we discussed amortization and council mm -hmm. felt that that was not a good uh, uh, policy approach. Um, you know, I, I think I still see this as a path, and maybe I'm wrong, but this seems like it's step one of two in, in, in implementing amortization without getting council to vote on amortization yet. You know, that's what it looks like to me. That's what it feels like to me. You know, rather than why don't we adopt, you know, proposed safety regulations uh, that simply address it from that standpoint in all, you know, non-single family units in R5, R8, R10 or whatever. In effect, you are doing that. The only thing we're doing by creating the registry and a penalty for failing to register is that we're requiring that the property owners come forward and let us know where they are. Because otherwise, it, it's just... Well, that kind of looks like a multifamily use. I don't know. Well, did, I mean, do those properties also have to be registered uh, rental units? They do. So they're registering. So to an extent, we have a registry, so we would sort of know where to look. And there's already there's already a, tech, a tool now that they would lose any grandfathering through over occupancy or, you know, and, and that actually references the housing sections of the code and the building sections of the code already. And in effect, the result is already in law. Well, here's, here's Except right. for the improvements that we would be requiring by going through this exercise to say that if you are a converted but, so, single family home, you have to do X, Y, So again, we could, we could adopt the proposed sa safety regulations, which emergency lighting, again, uh, exit signage, fire alarm, you know, <coughs> fire extinguisher. That's all good. That's the goal. That's good stuff. That's I mean, we good. could certainly, I mean, that's not, that's not proposed to be adopted as part of this right now, but you know, that's included in our packet. Mm -hmm. and I, I like I like the I like smoke alarms and carbon monoxide alarms, especially mm -hmm. after mm -hmm. you know, the Princess mm -hmm. Anne incident. But there's another question. It says that they would lose their grandfathering. A lot of these buildings are on lots. If they were single family, they were still non-conforming, legal non-conforming, because the house was too big for the lot. So they're already non-conforming. So do they well, lose that too? Do we have to tear down get, the building? No, we got to fix that because we need to change <laughs> our zoning code because those laws are, com again, completely. I mean, I mean and does this apply to um, every non-conforming use that we have citywide, not just ones that have been converted to multifamily? I mean, is it commercial and residential, and uh, whether they've been converted or they're single-family, owner-occupied, rental? I mean, they're well, all non-conforming, and I don't think we're. So, really so again, I, well, in this case, we're it's R five eight, R eight, and R ten. So again, going back to, you know, the adoption of the stand, the safety standards. That's of interest to me. The rest of this is really not, and certainly not right now. Um, you know, until the case on what is it five zero seven. Yeah. Until that's <clears throat> settled. This, through the Court just, of Appeals or the Supreme Court or wherever it goes, then I wouldn't even touch this. Yeah, this wouldn't affect the single-family home on too small a lot. This specifically is targeting um, single-family dwellings used continuously as multifamily dwellings. So it, that's that's what's targeted here. That's what we'd have to register. Uh, may I? Yes. First of all, in the paragraph where it says the theory of zoning ordinances that, that the non-conforming use is determined to public interest and in parenthesis health, safety, morals, and welfare, which justifies the need of a non-conforming use registry. What does morals have to do with, with non-conforming use? What are you talking about morals? I don't see it. It's in the letter. It's in the letter. It's in the memo. It's in the memo. What does, what does that have to do with anything, morals? Who judges that? We're, we're making a judgment call. But people's morality, you know. I don't think that has anything to do with housing. I do agree with, with um, uh, uh, President Day about maybe emergency lighting and, and make sure you had the smoke detectors, et cetera, et cetera, because they even decreased your insurance you know, if you have those things, I guess. Isn't that state law now? It may be. I don't know. But anyway, I have a problem with my neighborhood and my district that people live in these 
homes grandfathered in non-conforming legal illegal because there's a need for it. If there wasn't a need for it, you wouldn't have it. And what we're doing when people hear us on uh, PAC 14 <clears throat> and we're just regulating, 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 making laws, making laws, regulating, no wonder people don't want to come into the city and want to build outside of the city because of the regulations we're putting on um, people, not just especially renters and people that's less fortunate than others. We have people that um, come from different countries. We have people that um, can't afford a, uh, an a apartment, may live in a room. And I do know one place uh, that the people that live there are family, almost like family. They cook dinner on Sundays together. They uh, look out for one another. They make sure they're um, the people live there put their trash out in, in time because they live there for a long period of time. You have some people who have lived in these homes. Uh, I've been back in my neighborhood uh, since 81, has been in the neighborhood since I've been there. So they're really a regular people. So when you make these things illegal, you're basically going to put eventually people out on the street who cannot afford a, an apartment or an efficiency apartment. Because the people cannot afford 750 and 850 um, rent, and, and also the electric bill, which is outrageous, um, gas bill, water bill, and all that kind of stuff. So I'm not for this particular law. I am for the safety, the safety aspect of it. I don't like the word <coughs> somebody's morals and stuff. Shane, can I, may I? Yes. Because yeah, I just I want to defend Mr. Holland on that for a second because the, sen the sentence is right. The theory of the zoning ordinance is that the non-conforming use is detrimental to public interest, health, safety, morals, and welfare, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the, the theory is wrong. And What's the zoning is wrong. wrong. What's morals? I'm, say, I'm saying that <laughs> sentence is right. But the theory behind it has been disproven yeah. time and again. Yeah. And we, most cities are moving away from this type of zoning ordinance. Yeah. We're moving toward form-based codes. We're moving far, far away from this type of zoning ordinance. So. Yeah. I'm for the safety aspect of it. Right. Okay. Like so, so let I mean, so why don't we? I mean, is there council consensus to see a draft version of the adoption of the safety standards? Yes, I'm for the safety standards. I just have a couple of comments about. Um, I'm not sure if it would still fit under the safety standards or not. Probably. Uh, the second document, the application for registration for residential nonconforming use, that f first section, standards affecting nonconforming uses, um, number four, any nonconforming use dependent upon a building that has been declared dangerous and or contempt, condemned pursuant to the city housing standards code will be considered terminated upon declaration of order. We do that now, as a, I believe. That's pretty standard. But this is saying that um, somewhere in here, in this piece, it had language about condemning the property. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering, I'm trying to figure out why I have this note here. It says, I asked myself, does this include a water shutoff? So if they, um, oh, if it was condemned for any reason that they would lose their uh, grandfathering, and does that include like a water shutoff? Are we taking away their, their legal non-conforming use uh, status if the water shut off for some reason. I, I would say no. Again, again, this is this is just a draft to this um, uh, this registration application. But I I wouldn't think you, that you would lose a non-conforming use for having a water shut off. My, my my interpretation of condemnation is uh, a fire or it's been <coughs> gutted uh, or it's uh, 50 percent or more destroyed. Right. That's where it talked about it, but it said or or condemned okay. for any reason, and that's what got my attention not having water would constitute a condemnation right because it is one of the minimum livability requirements right so does so does somebody living in that place not paying the water bill um, on time getting it shut off cause the owner to lose their I mean the owners usually get the, bill the entire building to be condemned can be condemned and, and lose, lose the grandfather yeah, it wouldn't cause the whole building because it should be condemn a unit in a, you can in a condemn home a like unit. that mm -hmm. Do most of them have separate meters? No. Water meters? That would be one water meter, so. Well, then I would believe that the 
and I, we have some landlords here um, that could speak on that. Do, are they are they metered separately or are they metered all together? Would you have some, some That's what I that's what I've seen. I've seen both. Most are not metered separately. So do you, you have, have three or four in, in the building? Right, and then you split the bill up you, or the tenants. Uh, does the bill come to you then? Yeah, it comes to the it comes to the owner who then turns around and sends it. So you would never let the bill be late. You would never let it. Well, I wouldn't, but that's just me. Um, <laughs> Because the theory is that the tenant's obligation is to pay the bill. Legally, the way the code is set up, over much protestation for the last number of years, is the bill always goes to the registered property owner who's on the deed because the city doesn't want to chase tenants, apparently, if they would have. So, you've got to understand it. But, serious issue with respect to the notion that if you've got four units in a property that gets one water bill, one of the tenants doesn't pay, and therefore the landlord would pay. Them. I don't know how you condemn a unit. I don't know. I don't know. We have we have condemned a unit before. If there's a fire in one unit, just say the unit is uninhabitable, we have condemned a unit. Um, and lack of water is a reason to condemn. No heat in a unit is a reason to condemn. Okay. Yeah, so I don't know whether that part plays into what we were talking about with the Safety can do it. Just addressing the safety issue, if that would it would have, come into play. It wouldn't be. So. It wouldn't come into play at all. Yeah. But, but we would not condemn sure. the whole building. It would not affect that. They wouldn't cause them to lose to lose the use for the whole building. So my sense right now is that, um, and, and I'm just put putting this out on the table, is that we would at least want to table this indefinitely until um, there was a result of the. 507 Poplar Hill case, um, but uh, I, I'm not interested in bringing this forward to legislative session right now. No, I, I, I do, no. though, Hearing. like the safety could, additional could we, thing. And since we already have a list, we already have registration for rentals, you couldn't in, probably inspect all of those in a, in a year. Yeah, I mean, this that could we be have, applied to We have to a any good place unit. to start. Right. Mm -hmm. Because I'm all for making sure that everything is is uh, safe inside. Those standards, I mean, you know, those safety standards could be applied, and I assume there are some safety standards already, correct? You know, minimum life safety requirements. Are these different than those minimum life safety requirements? These are, yes. Okay. Um, can I mean, could we see something that articulated how they're different, you know, differentiated between this mm -hmm. list and what's currently required? I'm sorry, get yeah, up to the question. So the things that we mentioned are not in the minimum standards for they're they're above. Mm -hmm. they, they're included so, in, and go beyond. So some of them are. I mean this one's like, one of them's in IBC. Like like Tom explained. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead Tom. Yeah, a, a number of these uh, uses uh, were put into place year, many, many years ago where they didn't they didn't have the standards. You have a, a building where you have numerous units inside that converge in one point to go out. Mm -hmm. That's where you need your emergency lighting and a, you know a, you know a lift exit sign. If they have a separate uh, entrance exit, it's not needed. Mm -hmm. But it's where you have the high density converging into one one area for um, you know, getting out of the building in a timely manner. Mm -hmm. And you know back you know back in the days they they didn't have. The, the other thing is, this is a, it's proposed in here as a separate inspection that could be done in coordination with the rental inspection, but still charges an additional fee. So, if we were to look at that, I would say that I would favor that being done in conjunction with the rental inspection, the, the registration inspection. Um, at the same, I mean, you're already there. I don't yeah, one know that we need suit. another fee. One fell suit. Right. Yeah, I think we need to talk about it. Yeah, and, yeah, and I would think that just the process of doing it becomes that much easier when you have a change in tenant or a change in owner, you know, rather than set, you know, 
multiple inspections ending up in a cycle where you're inconveniencing a tenant or right. you know potentially violating the tenant's rights you know where you're uh, imposing an inspection on them through the landlord um, which I know can be problematic as well so that that can be done that will okay. be a discussion to put this for that yeah I'll, I'll be back here for a discussion for that <clears throat> So, all right, so uh, there's council consensus to table that indefinitely, and there's council consensus that we'd like to see the safe, life safety standards. You know, I, I think at first, I just want to see it. Side by side. Why this list is different, or how this list is different from what the current minimum standards are. Yeah, every time you adopt a new building code, uh, yeah. anything prior to that is, is grandfathered. Well, so is all of this adopted in the 2015 codes? Or, you know, will all of this, is all of this in the 2015 IBC? Yeah, for, for anything moving forward. Okay, but, yeah. but, but that would make it retroactive. Because when we 15 codes, anything prior to that, it's, it's grandfather. Okay, so these are the minimum life safety requirements That's a from 2015 forward. It's new construction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I just yeah. want to make sure I understand that. that, that I, these improvements be made to existing structures in order to bring them in up to a higher I, level of safety. I get it. And, and five well, of the six and let me, and are not let, currently required. And right let me now. just say, I'm not a firefighter like uh, our friend at the end of the table here, but um, I would think that you wouldn't want a dramatic difference between the life safety standards of new construction and, you know, uh, existing building stock. There is, though. I, there, I, there is. And I'm sure you're going to have to have some difference yeah. because certain things are... Yeah, it would be cost prohibitive to adapt. Yeah, but I mean, but minimize you're like to be able smoke to alarms, smoke detectors. It's 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 going to be and cost prohibitive. The, the balloon construction is there, and you're not going to change the balloon construction. Well, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that can't be, but, but there are there are reasonable, things. positive things that could be done to protect lives. Yep. That's what we need to see like, something. Yeah, I would like somebody to look into while you're doing that too. The carbon monoxide uh, requirement <laughs> for the detector. Because I'm in a multifamily unit, and it's been around for a number of years, and they came and put them in all the units, in every room in all the units. And I seem to recall from MML's legislative committee that there was a requirement to do that in multifamily. So we may already have that requirement yeah. and some others. I'm, I'm just not sure. Okay. We don't have property maintenance currently. We can. It's not in property maintenance yeah. code currently, but it could be at the state level. No, I mean, I mean the, state, the state law. I think I will look at it. I'll last year's research that. Yeah. Could you just let us? Combo I will. Smoke combo yeah, smoke CO. Yeah. I will look into that and get that. Okay. So what exactly do you want? You want the life safety standards put into some type of uh, draft? And maybe even before that, or simultaneously, just a comparison of what the minimum standards are and what is being proposed. Just so we can look at that. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Susan. Okay. Appreciate it. Okay. Next item on our agenda is PAC 14 audit requirements. Mr. Tillman. And Craig, do you want to come forward? Do you want to join us up here? Okay. Yeah, why don't you join us? Oh, no. Why are people leaving? Don't you all want to hear? They heard what they wanted to hear. All right. Yeah. Mark, are you going to be presenting yeah, this? Uh, okay. The, the council was interested in eliminating the requirement for the audit every four years. Yes. And before I could do that, I asked for a copy of the existing contract. And this is the one I got that's expired. <laughs> um, I'm guessing it was, uh, <laughs> um, you know, the, the agreement with PAC 14 and public access is really all part of Comcast's obligation to provide such a channel for, uh, you know, public broadcasting or, or public access and uh, that contract is still being negotiated um, I don't know that any of us will live to see that finalized <laughs> because Comcast is really dug in its heels and you know I think they're just a monopoly that's unbelievable but um, you know the, as far as 
what we could do at this point is we probably should develop a new contract that assumes we're going to negotiate something with Comcast eventually um, and that extends the time period for uh, PAC-14. The only thing we would need to do is just change that one affected section back there that requires the audit at least once every four years. And I would recommend that it be uh, uh, that we require an audit by a certified public accountant only when demanded by the city or recommended by the accountants for PAC-14. If the accountants found some irregularities when they were doing their work and recommended an audit, then we should insist upon one, just as if the city had concerns that money was being, you know, misspent or stolen, that we could also demand one. But short of that, they it do was an saying, annual review. Yeah. This recommendation actually came from the audit, or, yeah, from the from PKS. Right. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. you don't raise the threshold of money that requires. Right. And they do an annual review and they feel that's sufficient. But like you said, and you it's probably didn't get my future. email. You've been in meetings all day, probably. Yeah, I've, I've been. Uh, I did talk in and to out. the, uh, if, if I may. Sure, go ahead. I did talk to uh, Mr. Robinson today. He just got back from vacation. <laughs> he said uh, basically what you said there's two options. We can just extend the contract until the new agreement is in place and then execute a new contract. But he also said that contract's between the city and PAC 14. So if you want to extend it and, and put the new agreement in there now, that's fine. Or you could wait or that, extend it and then execute a new contract when the Comcast city negotiations are finished. Yeah. Or do a new contract now excluding any changes that may come with Comcast regarding what peg fees or right. possible franchises. And, and that's what I would recommend, that we right. just do a contract so that we have an agreement with PAC 14 contingent upon, you know, being finalized when the uh, Comcast agreement. He also recommended that you should be able to, you know, have a request an audit whenever you see fit right yeah I, so I, I think I understand that mr. Tillman my, my concern is that um, if there are major changes with the agreement with Comcast mm -hmm. um, I would want a new contract wholesale at that point I so would just put a contingency we, in anything that we sign that says when when the that anything we agree upon is is contingent upon it fitting within the new Comcast agreement so why can't why couldn't we simply extend the current contract until we sign the? You can. Okay, you can. that's fine. Let me. When was the last? You just did an audit. We just did an audit. So we have four years anyway, right? Right. Okay. So Correct. we can wait till we get the. Uh, we can just do an extension of this. Right. And, or an agreement to continue this. Mm -hmm. until. Right. And and you will be involved in the execution of the. Of the contract right. and of the agreement. It's just the, the end. We make sure that we don't forget in that time. In that time oh period. no we don't forget to cut the piece that says I don't know I what I'm gonna do is prepare a resolution for you to approve a new contract but the board at PAC 14 also has to approve it as okay. well and they when were they gonna meet uh, May 13th okay so we'll try and get it dealt with at that time all right good second Wednesday May. Sure. Yeah, they, they. So, with just so, you're until an the so an extension and we'll begin Right. Or, or whenever you are going to begin writing that new contract. Right. Well, the, we just need to have a, some kind of extension because right now this one is expired. Okay. So there is no agreement. It, I think the way we're working with Comcast now is the things are staying the same until the final agreement is reached. So that's kind of what we would do with PAC-14 okay. as well. So let's extend it until yeah, some reasonable amount of time that we think we'll get a agreement with Comcast. Next month, I'm confident. Yeah. Could we say let's, that So let's make it 24 months. Yeah. Well, let's extend it for 20 months. <laughs> Good idea. <laughs> because we do all run at the same time, and there is that extremely remote possibility that none of us return to the stable, and that Comcast isn't finished before that period of time. When we do this resolution, could we uh, make clear that uh, we're extending the contract except for that Section C that says about the audit part? And that way, it's clear going forward that that was and we don't forget to Can take do that part like out. that right and I, but I would recommend that we go ahead and say that as they recommended that upon demand the city could get an audit right and, but I mean obviously the city doesn't intend to do that unless some well, instead of eliminating something. we could replace that language. right that and I've, I've yeah. already got some language that says 
if recommended by PAC-14's accountants or if demanded by the city. Right. I'm Otherwise, saying, there would be no requirement. Rather than just an extension of what we have until we deal with Comcast. Yes. That Extend that it in, with that language. With that yes. condition. Yes. 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 That's what I meant to say. Okay. okay. I just want to make sure I was clear. Thank you. Yeah. Is there council consensus to do that? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Easy enough. <laughs> I wish a uh, renegotiation was there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. All of us do. Yeah, good. Never. <laughs> you should see my file. <laughs> oh, I can't oh, man. Yeah, yeah. Poor Tom. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. There's a reason they're the most hated company in America. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, next up is uh, the Wells Fargo donation of 806 North Division. Ms. Hussey. How are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm here to request that the um, council move forward a resolution to accept a donation by Wells Fargo Bank of 806 North Division Street. And uh, I didn't actually see it, but it's off near, I think, Philadelphia Avenue. It's two, two houses on past Philadelphia Avenue on the left-hand side headed north. Okay. Yellow, two story. Two houses north of Philadelphia. Yes. I've only Is seen it. it on of Cherry and um, that's mid block. No, it's in the middle of the block between Philadelphia and what's north of that? New York. New York. New York. And they've offered ten thousand dollars in addition to that. Yes. Is that for demolition purposes or? We can use it as we see fit, either oh. to rehab habilitate it or to demolish it. Do we have any sense of which we would need to do? Um, I think Ms. Stam said it probably needs to be demolished. But she hasn't been able to go inside to see what it actually looks like. Okay. It's not in too bad a shape. I had a chance to take a look at it through the windows when they first uh, reached out to us. But likely um, raising it would be the, be the best way to go. Just get it down and yeah. get it cleaned up. It's the last... Does anybody remember what the last cost was for raising a house? Uh, it, it's like they're, in, they're in the neighborhood of 10 to 15, but we're actually talking with uh, Mr. Moles and Mr. Landon at the city yard about doing our own demolition. So now we'd be down to just tipping fees. Years ago, we were taking uh, properties down ourselves. And How old was that when house? Mr. Jacobs uh, was. It was built in 1920. He, he stopped doing it. Sorry, I didn't hear the end of what you said. The, they stopped. The city used to take properties down. We had the equipment and resources for it, but um, one of the former public works directors just stopped doing it for whatever reason. So we can do it much cheaper if we do it ourselves. Okay. Let's do that. Yeah. Oh, I, I know Mr. Landon would love nothing more than to get on his next <laughs> yeah, and to take, that down. And to take a building down. But you said it wasn't in bad shape, so it, why would you it, tear it down? It, it has potential, but based on what we're Finding out on the uh, property more north of that, $100,000 to rehabilitate that receivership property. I'm wondering if it might not be better mm. to just take it down and start over. Because of the, you know, it's not as energy well, can efficient. can you build on it again? Well, it's a build a lot, lot. Sure. yes. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that's, I mean, that's the question. Is it, you know, can you afford to but, renovate but it and then actually to, sell it and make money off yeah. it? Similar to what the people did on Isabella Street. Is the house in better condition than the house that they're redoing on the Isabella Street, the Wicomic County Historical? That was it's, in, it's in similar condition. Oh, is that it? Okay. Yeah, it's right next to the apartment complex. That's much see. smaller than our house. <clears throat> house. <clears throat> Let me see. Can I see that? I can see, but my mother used to live on North Division mm -hmm. Street. It's that aluminum siding. <laughs> and that big group hides a multitude of things. <laughs> It doesn't look like a castle, so you know. No, so I'm, I'm, I'm inclined to accept yeah. the donation. And turn it down. Yeah. And, yeah. Um, and then it's not one of my favorite houses. The administration can do with it as it sees fit. Is there council consensus to yeah. accept the donation? Yes. yes. All right, so we'll move this to legislative session. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it.
Okay. There's a happy face. Next item on our agenda is an update to the Feldman's right of way agreement. And I know Mr. Lennox is out of town. So he, he, he provided a memo. I'm sure council yeah. had the opportunity to read through that. Um, currently work is going on at the former Feldman's property. Um, they've done some work, made some minor revisions to the approved by retention area and impervious surface, surface, surface calculations. Um, all of that's been submitted to public works. Uh, there's a site plan attached and it's showing the area where the proposed right of way would be. It's very tiny and difficult to see, but um, I'm of the, um, the impression now that Mr. Gillis is not looking for any um, compensation from the city that it would be gifted. So pr previous standing agreements from whatever it was 10 years ago with council. Um, he's going to do us one better. Yep. All right. That's excellent. Um, the, the one request that I would have is that the, uh, that be communicated to Mr. Gillis is that the, the standard of the Riverwalk meet the standard of the Riverwalk that we're getting ready to treat the rest of the Riverwalk with so that the same surface treatment be applied. And that's, I know Mr. Moles was looking at Mr. Moles at has it, it in our, it's in the because public works. You can't do the exposed aggregate anymore, so. Right. Yeah, the one thing that may, uh, I have to look at that when it gets updated. He may have a section, a boardwalk section in there, as opposed to concrete bridge. He shows, it, he shows it all as concrete. Does he? He does. Okay, yeah, I'm just making sure that it was an earlier version where it was boardwalk over top of the bottom retention area. He, sh he shows the whole thing as, okay. as boardwalk. Or as, as concrete river walk. It's difficult to see. It's tiny. Okay, good. Yep. The graphic convention used anyway is mm -hmm. yeah. concrete throughout. Okay, thank you. And is that that's something we can do through the public works agreement, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. Why don't you stay up here? Because the next time you're, 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 you're coming. Up. <laughs> Afternoon, everybody. Afternoon. Afternoon. And, and Mr. Stevenson, I'm sorry. Give me one second. Like, do you mm -hmm. mind contacting the chief and letting her know that we're a little bit ahead? Yeah, I'll, I'll step out and let her know. 15 minutes out of schedule or something. Yeah, one of the things when we do the river walk with the construction will be take possession of the patterns after it's done. So whenever we have any repairs to the concrete that we do, we'll be able to utilize those patterns. Okay. Thank you. Um, so that was just an update for council, you know, since we've talked about it and had it on our pending items forever. Uh, so we don't need to take any action. Next item on our agenda, however, is the green team. So, Mr. Moulds. Thank you. Green team. <coughs> yes. Um, I didn't know whether it would be Mr. Clean or obviously the dress right, I'm not green. <laughs> but this, this project follows up on some previous actions that council has made uh, and that was in your packets there. The, the first one was the shore power project, uh, which uh, Council President Day was involved with. We had a big rollout on that, where uh, the Washington College Envirom Center for Environmental Environment and Society is working on updating our uh, carbon footprint and analyzing our energy usage. And part of that memorandum of understanding that was approved between the council and on the shore power project was to work towards uh, becoming a sustainable community. Um, along that line also then, we uh, completed some tasks to be registered as a sustainable Maryland certified community that was approved by resolution 2452 back in October 2014 supporting participation in the program. <clears throat> so in order to become fully certified, what the city has to do is complete some action items and what the Sustainable Maryland certified community has this flyer that they put together that was in your packet mm -hmm. and on the back of it are the different action items that are part of it. Um, one of the, we're very confident that we will meet the goals of getting 150 points for becoming registered as a sustainable community. Uh, but one of the things that we, as a mandatory action, 
that we have to do is create a green team. This is an advisory group of citizens that would help uh, review and, uh, the different projects that the city would uh, move forward with uh, in terms of becoming sustainable and then over a period of time uh, continuing to do additional projects to maintain that sustainability in terms of these action items. And over a period of time, these, this list could get larger as, as more opportunities come about. Um, but we've gone through that with them and generated uh, the point ratings that we feel we've already completed. An example of that would be the community garden project that we did. That, that gets us some points. Mm -hmm. So uh, coming up with, I think the, the number we were coming up with is almost 180 points. But that would include the 10 points that was mandatory to create the green team and the additional 10 points that was mandatory for the green team to create an action plan. And there, and on the website, there are parameters and guidance that are provided for this group to do that. So we provided that information. Um, what I did was put together a, a draft resolution, uh, very straightforward using some of the language that was provided through the Sustainable Maryland website uh, for consideration. It follows on the, the verbiage that was used to create the Bicycle Advisory Committee. Uh, as, so we went recreating the wheel. That's kind of where we are um, in terms of we're looking at uh, a minimum of five members um, to, to be on the green team. I had done a, a presentation, Jake had another commitment um, at Salisbury University, and towards the end of that I put a little plug in for anybody that were looking for forming this green team, and I had three students come up to me wow. at the end of that that were interested in being part of it. So right. a nice environmental program there. So there's some definite interest and traction there if you want to proceed with um, I mean, I, I just, I, when I looked at the sustainable uh, Maryland list originally, I thought, wow, we, I don't know if we'll get there. Looking at it yesterday, I counted 245 points <laughs> that I thought we were up to. And there was uh, plenty I wasn't sure about. Mm -hmm. And I remember when this was first created, when this program was created, copying or, you know, designed after Sustainable Jersey, the first in the country. Um, and, you know. It was designed to be very, very difficult and very, very cumbersome and very, very rare that this honor would be bestowed on a community. And yeah, it's pretty cool that we we're well over the yeah, minimum I remember requirements. Probably two and a half, three years ago with MML Fall Conference, bringing that back and going, we already have the points, but I don't remember there being the manda any mandatories on there then. So this is a moving, not really a moving tar but target, but it's changing. It's up being updated, right? Yes, now. yes. It'll evolve as, as more sustainable ideas are there to get implemented. Um, the one thing I know when, when Jake and I had talked about the number of points we're getting on, what I wasn't sure about was if we get one community yard, do we get an extra 20 points for a second one? Yeah, that's... Yeah. I think he was double dipping. I get a couple of points out of it. Oh, no, no, no. That was, I only counted the one community <laughs> yard, okay. but if you add the four others, then, yeah, we're through the roof. <laughs> Did we get any points for recycling those 20 tons of electronics? I... And the 600 televisions that you just yeah. sold for a buck? For $5. $5, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, if, if there's any way I can do it, I will try. Um, I'm just more tickled pink that we can get rid of the darn things uh, next week. Yep. Okay, thank you. Um, so at this point, you're looking for council to uh, consider the adoption of this uh, creation of the green team. Um, you know, the composition, I think, makes sense to me. It's fine by me. Uh, the whole process you know, does look like it's parallel to the Bicycle Protection Advisory Committee and many of our other committees. It makes sense to me. And it has staggered terms. And it has actually has staggered yeah, I was up, caught up on that and everything. <laughs> yeah, again, when we put it together, it was a discussion uh, Tom uh, Stevenson and I had as to whether um, a resolution of this nature, whether you wanted Mark to review that. That's your choice at this point. I don't know where we stood on that. I think we're okay with it. Okay. Mark, any concerns, any thoughts? No. Any other comments, questions, concerns no. from the council? Consent agenda. <laughs> well, let's let's bring it. Uh, let's separate it from the consent agenda, just so that we. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's talk about it. Yeah, we'll talk. Okay. Yeah. Council consensus to move it forward. Or yes. Tim, you yes. have something? Yes. Okay. Yes, but Tim. Yes. Yes. I had another question, but this uh, I don't know if the butterfly garden will fall into it. But we, can we get that staked out so we know where it is if we can start on it? 
Yeah, just, just, some, yeah. just some, uh, have just you some, met? Just some plastic sticks would be good or whatever. So we I haven't met with anybody, doing. but I know Mrs. Rodriguez and uh, Councilwoman yeah. Mitchell, did you talk yeah, to her I've, as well? Yeah, I've been in touch with her as well. She's yeah. kind of We're ready to reached roll out with to all it, of us. Uh, yeah. I'm sorry? We were ready to roll with it. They have some plantings and they have the kids and... Right, but where? That's where it was. We were going to be at the marina property. Yeah. Like I think I called, I guess, the, that the, the bridge, bridge, bridge standard. Standard. Oh, okay. Kind of what are you doing? That. Okay. Is that where we're going to be? That, that was the discussion. I think that, we that's what I thought we were going to do because we checked that's to see if there was a yard hydrant there. I love that. That's going to be safe. Great. So can we can we stake out an area there? Yeah. How much space do you need? I'd say 10 by 10 would be fine. Okay. Okay. Yeah, or a little greater than that if you can squeak the money. So one of my thoughts was in the park, in the area where we have the growth, that it might be some nice to draw some butterflies in there. But um, depending on the, the species of um, butterfly plant that you get, right. they can be creepy crawlers. Uh, so you have to be careful about well, where, where you put them. Well, this, well, this is to stay in water. They need water they, nearby. I mean, to be but what I'm trying to say, the flooding. Oh, yes. I mean, you know, just yeah, I mean, the plants there. Will they, will they live? Kill them. Kill them with the old. The, we have flooding How issues. Yeah. Will they? Oh no, no, they won't hurt, won't hurt them. Okay. Won't hurt them. Good. Yeah. All right. Whatever so we plant there will be fine. Yeah. Some ten by ten area at the bridge tenders spot. We could test. Great. Yeah. Okay. And then if they're successful, that we can look at other areas. And that will, yeah, we'll look at other areas. And I think that the park is a great area to do it too. Another water source right there, and you know, make it part of the zoo. Make it a zoo. Yeah, it, you know, you what butterflies. Doesn't like to see butterflies. There you go. <laughs> Mike, thank, you. thank you. Appreciate thank you. it. Um, we'll, Chief's on our way. Yeah, okay. We uh, we'll, yeah, we'll recess for two minutes, five minutes until Chief gets here. Okay. Don't stray far. <laughs>